Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. People wanted to split completely away from the EU and Theresa May has been, you know, working on this great deal, which a lot of people don't think it's a great deal. I wanted to get your take on the Brexit. I mean, is this deal that Theresa May is put, that she's pushing, is this the deal that people voted for? Yeah, you know, what's funny, David, is uh, it's not. I, I mean, she's doing, she put together what she thought would work. You know, tra traditional po list of politicians compromises. I've got because of what I do, I've you know, I've got people I know all around the planet now. And I've got some friends that live in London, you know, that live in the UK that are on top of this. And uh, it, 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 I think for almost certain it's going to fail uh, when the vote comes. And you're going to get, you know, there's so much scandal around it now, uh, illegal scandal as well, contempt of parliament votes, no confidence votes that are coming. There's an increasing likelihood, uh, Dave, of maybe a second referendum even, you know, where Brexit, the whole idea of Brexit just goes out the window, you know, that it's framed by the city of London, you know, the bankers and the politicians and everybody as well. You know, we did our best to support the people. It didn't seem to work out. So now we're going to I think we're going to try to get to make sure that's really what you want to do. And and then that, you know, in a second referendum, they may vote to stay in the EU. And what I th I guess as it relates to what I do on a daily basis, what I you know, it's the euro is about 60 percent of the dollar index. I mean, it's it's more than, you know, it's the majority of the dollar index. And you got all these people out there here at the end of 2009 or 18 that are still talking about multiple Fed hikes next year. And uh, somehow the U.S. economy is going to be strong and the dollars king dollar. Right. It's going to go through 100 and on to 110. Well, none of this is taking into consideration the idea that, wait a second, if if there's no Brexit, the euro which because that was a threat to the euro, the euro will likely rally. And if the euro rallies at 60 percent of the dollar index, the dollar index is going to go down, not up. And so this is this is for, you know, it doesn't matter what you're invested in. But if you're particularly if you're paying attention to precious metals, this is something you need to watch over the next couple of weeks. This is going to be some big news. I mean, we have the Brexit going on right now, but we also see a lot of other things happening around the world. I mean, we have riots in France. Mm -hmm. We have Merkel. She said she's not going to be running again. We have the incident in the Kerch Strait. We have Deutsche Bank crisis. I mean, why is there so much chaos going on right now around the world? I mean, are things changing or are, are the people like, you know, especially in France, are, are they saying, you know, something we don't want this anymore? I mean, what is happening here? Yeah, I, you know, it is a it is a confluence of events. Now, maybe they're all unrelated and they're all just simply happening, you know, coincidentally at the same time. You know, those riots in France are particularly interesting. I've got some uh, French uh, folks at TF Metals Report that are subscribers that have been able to give me some context of what's going on there. I, I didn't realize, for example, that there's a regulation that, that requires every French citizen that has a car to keep this yellow Trent, you know, translucent vest in their trunk. Right. I had no idea. And so as a as a revolt against fuel taxes and all the other nonsense, wearing those yellow vests that everybody has makes perfect sense. And it's not, you know, these aren't just like the Antifa, you know, idiot thug types. These are a lot of just regular folks that are fed up. And you feed that into, you know, the unrest in, in Germany with Merkel's policies, you know, and the open immigration that she put in a couple of years ago. You got all this stuff, as you mentioned, going on in in uh, Eastern Europe with Ukraine and the provocations that 
Uh, that I mean, at least in my view, the clear provocation that they're putting up against Russia to try and try to get some NATO support. And I that's a mess. Now, again, I don't know. Maybe that's euro negative and uh, and dollar positive at the end of the day. Hard to say. But I, I think one thing that is, again, as we relate this back economically over the past month here in the U.S., there has been a surge of U.S. bond buying. And uh, for example, the 10 year note has gone from three and a quarter percent down to 285 as we speak here uh, on the 6th. I mean, that's a huge move. The two the, the two year note has fallen 10 basis points today. So there is a mass movement. You know, all these events are taking place and there's this huge global movement into any kind of safe haven. I mean, that's not, you know, just a small, I mean, it takes a lot of money to move the bond market that much. It makes you wonder if maybe it's not all coincidence, Dave. Maybe behind the scenes, big money, smart money realizes that uh, this is just the beginning. You know, there's a lot of bad stuff coming over the horizon. We'll see. If you look at the stock market, it came down something like uh, 700 points. I mean, why is this market dropping the way it is right now? I mean, is there anything that's causing it that you know? Well, it, 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 at first glance, there was almost like a a breaking point that was reached in interest rates back in early October, that 10 year note that I mentioned earlier got to three and a quarter percent. And the very day it did, it was like October the 9th, the stock market began to crash from its all time highs. And then uh, the bond market rallied, you know, at the same time and rates fell back down. Well, then back in first November, uh, first week of November, it got back up to three and a quarter again. And lo and behold, the stock market crashed again. Well, now the stock market's continuing to crash, even though rates aren't rising. That's that's intriguing me quite a bit. Like I said, just from a safe haven standpoint, I think this the stock market we can talk about on multiple levels uh, why it would be uh, moving downward at this point. But things that are on my radar, you mentioned earlier, like Deutsche Bank. I mean, it's down. It's less than nine dollars a share here in the U.S. now, less than eight euro. I mean, these are all time lows. And the thing was one hundred and fifty dollars a share 10 years ago. I mean, it, it's held together. I, I you know, the, I think the Germans will backstop whatever they can because it's their national bank, basically. But for crying out loud, when you hear about the not only trillions, but quadrillions in a derivative exposure that they may potentially have. Uh, that's hanging out there. A uh, GE is another huge story as it falls apart. I mean, they've got 600, uh, I, I don't want to misspeak. I think it's $600 billion. Could that be right? In, in commercial paper, maybe I'm, I'm, uh, putting too many numbers together, but GE is a huge player in the commercial paper market. And as they struggle, and uh, and they're selling off, you know, they're just trying to raise cash by selling off their best assets at this point, which is not a good long term strategy. But as GE moves to, let's say, uh, below investment grade status with their debt, what's that going to do to the uh, commercial paper market? What's that going to do to money market funds that own commercial paper from GE that can't own it anymore uh, if it gets moved below investment grade? And there's like I said, maybe that's what that six hundred billion dollar number was, was the amount of commercial paper uh, in, in its entirety across the market that is just barely hanging on at triple B. And so there are all these things out there. Uh, you know, we look at uh, mortgage rates and what they've done and in and, and, uh, auto industry and the subprime loans in the auto industry. I mean, there are all these signs that really begin to look a lot like 2007 and 2008. And uh, maybe that's what the stock market's anticipating more than anything else, Dave. So you mentioned 2007, 2008. Uh, all these companies, they've been buying back their stocks. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have a huge amount of debt. I mean, and a lot of people are talking about, you know, corpor corporations are going to be in trouble once everything starts to fall apart because if they purchase their stocks and the stock market is falling, I mean, isn't this going to be a complete and utter disaster? Yeah. Yeah, that's just it. I mean, a lot of folks have done the studies of, even with this latest tax cut, you know, that was allegedly going to repatriate all this cash from overseas and bring it back home that a lot of the companies that took advantage of that. And then they, all they simply did was buy back more of their own stock. They didn't do anything with that cash. Then 
uh, maybe I'm just cynical in summarizing it this way, but it seems like a lot of CEOs only put those plans in place just to keep the stock up so they can cash out their options that they grant themselves, you know, and uh, <laughs> yeah. keep their share price up. But anyway, it, it's um, that has been a big driver of keeping the stock market up. And, and Dave, like the stock market now, the combined market capitalization of the stock market is lar- in the U.S. is larger than GDP. And so you, you look at that and you think, well, hell, the stock market is the economy at this point. And so as we round into 2019, if if the stock market's falling, the economy is already starting to contract. Some of the data points we got today were just miserable. The employment report tomorrow will be interesting to see what it shows if that's starting to happen. Uh, and, and then you got this kind of we'll call it political risk that's coming next year, because now that the Democrats control the House, you can be certain there's going to be about 101 different investigations from 101 different committees and subcommittees into Trump and his family and his business dealings and everything else. His agenda is going to whatever his agenda is, is going to come to a screeching halt because the Democrats aren't going to grant him any victories to run on. Uh, next year now in 2020. Uh, and so I think the whole thing just comes completely screeching to a halt. This notion that the Fed is going to keep raising rates next year is an absolute joke. That's another thing that the bond market is telling you that that's not going to happen. In fact, uh, by the time we get into the summertime, we're going to be talking about the Fed easing and even more QE. Because we have, at least at this point, $1.6 trillion in net treasury issuance next year that somebody's got to buy. And so I guess it all kind of ties back together into this uh, notion that I have that where uh, a lot of folks are selling predictability and certainty and, oh, boy, yes, uh, the stock market's going to be great and everything's going to be fancy, you know, and everything's great and the the market's going to go up and the the Fed's going to keep hiking and the economy's going to keep soaring. Uh, Probably not. All of these things are pointing towards something other than that. And then, of course, in, in my world, that points to I think 2019 is going to be the best year uh, for gold and silver since 2010. And I mean, let me just go back to the Fed where you said they're not going to be raising rates. Do you think they're going to be raising rates this December? Yeah, you, that's what I, there's a lot of question about that. I think so. I, I'm banking on that happening still. And I think the probabilities as we speak are still about 65 percent or something like that day. Um, I think they've telegraphed that well enough. What's going to be interesting in two weeks is the Fed lines, as we call them. You know, the the notes that that hit after that FOMC, people are going to parse that, you know, and look and see how that changes and everything else. Uh, That two year note that we mentioned, that's telling you that there's that this is changing the two year note. Anybody can pull up uh, a a chart of it and see how it has gone straight up at a 45 degree angle to yield on it, just as Fed funds have gone up uh, every 90 days for the last whatever uh, six quarters. But the two-year note now is rolling over. In fact, uh, at whatever that is this morning, 270, that's now lower than it was back in early September. And the Fed hiked in the middle of September. And if they hike again here in December, that means they'll have raised the very shortest rate by 50 basis points, while the two-year note rate has fallen by 5 or 10. I mean, they're, they're already inverting the yield curve, 2 versus 3 and 2 versus 5. They're about to invert it 2 versus 10. Uh, it, it makes it um, highly unlikely. I'm not going to say impossible because God knows what the you know these evil bankers' actual motives are, but I think it's highly unlikely that uh, there, we may get a hike in March. But that, I, boy, anything past that, like I said, is is pretty unlikely. So if the Fed hikes in December and let's say one more time in 2019, what does that do to gold and silver? Yeah, see, that's just it. Uh, That has been, I mean, that's why I compared this to 2010, because if you go back to 2010, which was the year I I started this whole TF Metals report gig, uh, that was an environment where we'd already had QE1, Right. That was in place. It was supposed to be the only time the Fed was going to do quantitative easing. Uh, that was which was announced in March of 2009. Then it ended. And for the first half of 2010, the metals traded sideways. Um, hmm, interestingly, at about twelve hundred and fifty dollar gold, and about eighteen dollar silver. Then as we got into the second half of 2010, this realization hit that 
oh boy, uh, they're probably going to have to do more QE. QE2 was announced in November of 2010. And then you know what happened, you know, into 2011, silver went from 18 to 48. Eventually gold went all the way up to 1900. Uh, and it was because of this, you know, the, the, the fiscal crisis in the U.S., the, you know, all the debt ceiling stuff and the QE looked like it was going to go to infinity. Once the market uh, understood what was happening, everybody wanted gold and everybody wanted the miners. We're in the opposite situation as we speak. Everybody hates gold. Nobody wants to own gold and certainly nobody wants to own the miners. Um, as this realization begins to hit and then actually plays out as Fed policy, uh, there is going to be, again, a, finally a shift and a flow of funds, both you know regular people like you and I, but more importantly, institutions that are going to be moving into seeking any kind of gold that they can get their hands on, uh, you, you know, GLD shares even, um, and then the miners too. So you got to kind of be in front of this stuff. I, you know, what I would caution people against when people have to watch out for is getting caught uh, flat footed like they were as we came out of the bear market in 2015, because, you know, remember the Fed hiked for the first time at the uh, this time in 2015 and everybody was out there except yours truly here talking about how gold was going to go now to 800 and silver was going to go to eight. And I said, no, man, that's not how it's going to work. And instead, we had these massive rallies of 30 percent in gold and 50 percent in silver the first half of 2016. And sadly, a lot of folks missed out, you know, because they weren't buying at the lows. They were buying in June, you know, after the shares had already, you know, the, the who had already tripled. And so uh, there's uh, there's some real advantage to, you know, being able to look over the horizon and, and consider the stuff that you and I've been talking about for the last 20 minutes and say, you know what? Yeah, you know, I'm going to be kind of a contrarian here and uh and start adding to my stack or beginning a physical stack or or buying some some mining shares now because i think you know this is how it is going to play out uh and, and nobody's you know there's not a real recognition of that at least not at this point do you still think there's manipulation going on by the fed and i mean i know there's other banks that uh individuals were caught uh manipulating gold but do you still think the central bank is still manipulating the gold price I, they they clearly have a vested interest in low gold prices. You know whether it's the trading desk that they have at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, or whether it's the you know the guys at the Bank of International Settlements in Basel, uh, or whether it's just you know the the desks of J.P. Morgan and and the like, like that what was that dude's name that uh, uh, that actually got convicted of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a month ago from J.P. Morgan, uh, I think it's all of those. The Fed, obviously, as much as they deny it, has an interest in keeping the price of gold low because uh, it, it's a reflection of confidence, a reflection of confidence. I mean, if gold was soaring $200 a day and was at $2,000 and $3,000, even CNBC and Bloomberg would have to admit, boy, there must be something really wrong here, right? So it's, 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 it's like this secondary indicator that they'd like to keep on, in check so that they can keep their confidence scheme going, confidence in their paper, confidence in their debt. Now, uh, is it manipulated? Of course it is. Everything. What isn't manipulated? That's that's what's so funny. You get these people out there with their newsletters, you know, where they count their waves and and try to make it sound like, you know, like they can see the future based off of, you know, whatever. And and they if they were to admit that the market was manipulated, well, then they're, you know, the people that buy their newsletter would go, well, wait a second, what am I paying you this for then? If, you know, that doesn't make any sense. And so they, they plant their flag in the ground that somehow gold and silver aren't manipulated. At the same time, though, what readily admitting I mean, the stock market's clearly uh, easily manipulated by the central banks. The bond market, that's what QE is. That's manipulation of interest rates. Everybody knows that every, almost every single central bank moves to manipulate the value of their currency in the Forex markets. Oh, but yet gold and silver are sacrosanct. You know, oh, no, the, they, though, oh, boy, no, no, don't even question whether that's a free and fair determination of, you know, of a price. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> it definitely still happens. And, and, and Dave, I don't know if we get a chance to talk today, but uh, about palladium, um, it's a real hot subject at this point, And a lot of people are following it on and are getting texts about, hey, palladium is more expensive than gold. Uh, um, that's not what the, at least to me, that's not what is the significance of palladium. Um, there's some real interesting signs there because we're all waiting for the point 
where uh, gold and silver had their price discovered through the actual exchange of physical metal, you know, your paper fiat for physical metal, not the exchange of these derivatives that the banks can create from thin air, uh, you know, and pretend that that somehow represents the price. Well, the, what's going on in palladium has a chance to upset that entire scheme. And um, that's something that people need to stay on top of, too, because that could be really be a game changer next year as well. You know, when I when I think of uh, gold and silver, I kind of compare it to the housing market. And you'll have to hear me out on this one. I Because I do believe that the housing market is also manipulated, making the, the Fed comes in, they pick 20 cities, they can pump up the bubbles in housing. Now, what everyone does with housing is when the Fed pumps up the bubble, makes housing prices go up, because as housing prices go up, people feel comfortable. Like, oh, look, my yeah housing prices up. I can go out and spend. I can take an equity line of credit. People go out and they flip. So the housing prices continually move up. And then all of a sudden, everyone, you know, gets stuck when the housing prices drop dramatically because they've been, you know, renting, speculating and doing all these things. When you look at gold and silver, the Fed does the opposite to that. They suppress that. And this is the point that everyone should be purchasing gold and silver. So the Fed manipulates housing and they make everyone think that housing is going up naturally and everyone buys it. The Fed manipulates gold and silver and they make the price go down and everyone says, I'm going to stay out of it. But that's when they should be purchasing it because the opposite effect is happening here. And it's just amazing how people think about this because when the housing market comes down, that's actually when you're supposed to buy, like when it hits yeah. rock bottom. Right now, gold and silver, I believe, is you know at a point where everyone should be buying as much as they possibly can. I mean, look at China and Russia. I mean, they're out there. And they're purchasing a huge amount of gold and they're continually doing it because I think they know when this manipulation game ends, which it eventually will, they know what they have is going to skyrocket. And, you know, what are they paying? Probably less than $1,200 uh, $1, an ounce because they're probably buying it in bulk and stuff like that. So they're probably getting a better deal, but they're buying a lot of it at a very, very cheap price. And I think they know eventually what's going to happen is that, you know, gold is going to skyrocket when the manipulation stops. And I think people, you know, can't wrap their brains around, you know, when to purchase, when not to purchase. You don't purchase it when it's starting to move up like, you know, 1600 1700 1800 because really at that point you're too late you're too late to the game which is what we i mentioned earlier you know in, in just referencing the microcosm of 2016 you know that's a similar story within the you know the confines of of the gold trade but what you know i, I as we discuss this manipulation thing i if i might just kind of veer off for a second and sure. and give everybody just a quick history lesson because again people think well this is just the way it's always been and and you know you got your tinfoil on too tight if you think it's manipulated look anybody anyone i challenge anyone listening to us just go do this research on your own you'll find that what i'm about to tell you is entirely true you know at the end of world war ii there was a Bretton Woods agreement which made the dollar the world's reserve currency and then you could exchange a dollar for an ounce of gold at $35 an ounce. And that gave the dollar stability. It gave the world trade system stability and all this kind of stuff. Well, the problem is by the time we got to the late 1950s, all these, you know, countries that were building themselves back, like France, for example, suddenly had, a, 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 they were awash in dollars. You know, they start building stuff. They sell it to us. We buy it in dollars. They have dollars in their foreign currency reserves. And they're like, well, this is fine, but we'd rather have the gold. And so the late 1950s, these countries start showing up and they exchange their dollars for gold, which is what the system was set up to do. Well, this was a massive scandal. In 1957 and 58, there were congressional hearings because the hoard of, the, of gold that the U.S. had at the end of World War II was already being depleted by a third. Oh, what? How can this be happening? OK, so the U.S. is supplying its own gold into the market to maintain this $35 an ounce thing. Well, that wasn't going to fly. So in 1961, the U.S. got together with seven other countries and formed what's called the London Gold Pool. Anybody can look this up, where we all, all eight companies, countries pledged gold into this system that would feed gold in if price ever moved above $35 an ounce to bring it back down. And then they would buy gold back if it ever moved back below $35 an ounce manipulating the price. 
to keep it at 35. Well, that worked for seven years until all of a sudden there was so much demand for gold again that there wasn't enough gold left from these countries to supply it into, and price took off. It just wasn't working anymore. And the London gold pool collapsed to the point where price now begins to move. Nixon has to close the gold window in 1971. And, you know, the rest is history. Well, the next thing they tried is the system that holds to today. Wait a second. If there's not enough physical gold for, you know, to, to keep the price down, then we've got to alchemize gold. We've got to make pretend gold. We've got to convince the world that this digital derivative that trades on the COMEX is gold. Or we've got to convince the world that, you know, they can buy shares in the GLD and that's gold. Or we've got to convince the world that the unallocated accounts, you know, that are fractional reserve system in London through the LBMA, that that's gold. And so you end up with a system where gold is priced as if it's abundant. No, it's all these derivatives and phony gold that's abundant. The real thing that backs up this system is not abundant. And so what, what's going to be interesting is when this structure fails, because it will. It, we can talk about the reserve currency and why are the Chinese and the Russians buying gold? Because they understand that the, the dollar system is going to fail and it's going to take this gold part of the system with it. And it, going back to the dollar for a second, every fiat currency system since the dawn of mankind has eventually failed because you have to print so much of it to service all your debts and the thing just goes out of control like what we are doing now. Eventually what then happens is society, the globe in this case, reverts back to sound money and starts over again. This is why the Russians and the Chinese, they know this. That's why they're accumulating gold and silver so that they are prepared for when gold is money again and the basis of the system. If, if, I, I've often said, Dave, look, if, if the Russians and the Chinese are doing this, if they're converting their dollars for gold at this point, uh, just as the French were doing in 1968, uh, you know what? They might know a little more about it than you and I and everybody listening. Uh, you might want to take their advice and do some of that yourself because we all have dollar reserves. You have dollar reserves. I have dollar reserves. My savings account, right? It's my Charles Schwab account. Right. Uh, I think it'd be wise. <laughs> this is why we still have TF Metals report after all this time. It's wise to convert some of your own dollar reserves into precious metals as well. And uh, again, I'm sorry I spun off into this wacky history lesson, but people need to understand. All these people comment about gold and they, they, they have no idea how the market works or the history behind it or the level of the scam and the fraud and the manipulation. They just see the price go across on, on CNBC and think they know what they're talking about. It is a far more complex situation than people understand, even begin to understand. And they'll really, like you said, Dave, the best thing people can do is to do what the Russians and Chinese do and buy low because $1,200 is not the price that's determined through physical trading. It's the price determined through these funky derivative pretend gold things that they have. The day is coming where that's going to crash. Maybe, you know, this volatile's new 2019 looks, maybe it'll be next year. Um, so the time to prepare is now. So anyway, sorry about the rant. <laughs> no, that's okay. So do, do you think the dollar is, I mean, we all know that the fiat system, it doesn't last forever. We've seen throughout history where, you know, the British had the reserve, the Spanish, the French, and it goes all the way back in time. When this dollar system imploded, I mean, we're getting to the point where we have so much debt. We, I mean, we don't have enough, you know, tax receipts coming in to, you know, sustain this type of debt, plus the interest on top of that. And if rates continually move up, it, it, it could be completely impossible. But do you see us, the United States, transitioning into a different type of currency? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of talk about that, Dave, whether there'd be like a domestic dollar and an international dollar, you know, that has to be devalued and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's going to be, I, I don't know, I've not lived through this before. Uh, the only thing that history tells us is this often uh, doesn't occur peacefully, you know, <laughs> that the country that has the exorbitant privilege doesn't just say, okay, yeah, you're right. It's not fair that we have this anymore. We'll let you have it instead and go. No, usually there's some type of major war involved as that baton is passed and that transition is made. And you can look around the world. I mean, the U.S. already senses that threat and they're not going to lay down and let this happen peacefully. That, look at the petrodollar. Look at the defense. You know, and, and again, I, I say the petrodollar is if everybody listening to us understands what, what I'm talking about. Please Google 
petrodollar or petrodollar recycling scheme uh, or whatever and understand the logistics, the math, the, f- the financial importance uh, of the deal that was struck in 1973 between Kissinger and the Sauds to have Saudi Arabia always price energy, crude oil in dollars and trade in dollars creates demand for dollars so that all these dollars that we've created since going off the gold standard, trying to have guns and butter at the same time, that all these trillions of dollars are in a sense incubated in the global bond markets and global uh, foreign currency reserves because of this ongoing demand for dollars as a reserve currency. And a large part of that is this petrodollar system. Well, the U.S. is going to fight to maintain that for as long as possible. Why do you think it's see no evil, hear no evil with Saudi Arabia and this whole Khashoggi thing, right? Because we go, oh God, we got to do it. I mean, they can bomb thousands of starving Yemeni kids and we're going to look the other way because we got to have their support for this petrodollar thing because it's a linchpin to the whole dollar system. So we're always going to look the other way. It doesn't matter what they do. They could they could publicly execute half their population and, and you know, wash, official wash and be like, well, you know, but they're our friends because they have to. We're going to do everything we can to support that system. Why is there uh, what's going on in Ukraine? You can trace that back five years ago when it began in 2014 because the Russians had the audacity of wanting to build a pipeline across Ukraine to feed Europe with natural gas. And the Saudis don't want that. The Saudis want natural gas from them to be go up through Turkey and Syria. Syria, huh? There's another Cold War hot point. Anyway, Dave, all of this stuff connects. And so how it eventually plays out. I, I, look, all I know is that eventually it's going to happen because, as you said, this this exorbitant privilege is transitory. You know, it goes from one country to the next. You can go back centuries and see that how this transition is made from, you know, Portugal to Spain to, you know, whatever, to UK to us. But it's going to change again. All I know is it's probably not going to be a peaceful transition. And that's that's something that yeah, I think everybody needs to understand and prepare for. Yeah, and I I know um, Sergey Lavrov and many other uh, individuals within Russia, they've been telling, I mean, they've been speaking out to different countries saying every country should use their national currency, not the dollar anymore. Because we know that Russia, China, they've been trading using their national currency. I think India is on board trading their national currency. I mean, if all these countries start to use their own currency and not the dollar... Doesn't that just speed up the process of of the dollar imploding? Yeah, absolutely. And 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 look at how the U.S. uses, say, for example, the SWIFT system as a weapon. Yeah. Trying to exclude countries like Iran from being able to use it. Well, that's all getting uh, kind of maneuvered around as well. Just as just what a couple of days ago, I saw a story that the EU is going to have a set of proposals next week that's going to suggest you know ways to work around the dollar. I mean, all of these things are are cuts to the to the dollar. And like I said, that doesn't mean it's going to end, you know, that the system is, you know, we're going to wake up tomorrow and and all of a sudden the dollar is not going to be the reserve currency anymore because that's you know, the U.S. is never just going to peacefully, you know, quietly let that happen. But there is definitely a foundation being laid uh, behind the scenes, you know, whether it's the the Eurasian countries, if you want to, you know, of the of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, you know, coming up with some type of regional alternative or whether it's something with the EU and China and Russia to come up with an alternative to SWIFT, you know, all these kind of things. Whether it's a, in Shanghai where now you can trade a crude oil that's denominated in yuan, uh, you know, all these things are threats, but, they, you know, it doesn't make it imminent. And, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I wouldn't want to sit here and say, yes, yeah, so the dollar is going to fail next year. It might. I mean, all this might come. I, I think we were headed down that road in 2008 when the, you know, these fatal cracks appeared in the system and became clear to everybody. But I don't think the Chinese and the Russians and all the other creditor nations had a foundation of a alternative yet. You can clearly see in the 10 years that have followed that they have built that foundation or they're building that foundation to have an alternative for the next time that the piper comes calling and the U.S. and the, and the European markets begin to crash and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that that foundation is being laid and we may make that maybe that will be the cause uh, to really uh, start to break apart the dollar system. And that could come as soon. That could come as soon as next year. So. Anyway, the moral of the story is, I think anybody who is prudent about this 
and assesses what's going on in the world and looks, tries to look forward, but at the same time with an appreciation of history, can begin to understand that, you know, just simply whistling past the graveyard and checking my 401k balance every 90 days, probably I need to be a little more proactive than that. And uh, obviously, that's what I try to preach. I know that you do, too. And that's what T.F. Bettles' report is.